Now the part you've all been waiting for. <laughs> the better parts. Um, so um, this man was an aviator and author. He is best remembered for being the author of The Little Prince, which is a wonderful children's book. And like all of the really wonderful children's books, it's not really a children's book. He wrote lots of other books as well. And in one of them, he has this amazing sentence. It seems that perfection is attained not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing more to subtract. That's just a, a brilliant quote, and it's been used to talk about architecture, design, engineering, anything that combines creativity and discipline. He was talking about the design of airplanes, but it seems to be much broader. And I think it applies especially to computer programs because we have a particular relationship with perfection that goes beyond all other disciplines. Our, what we write has to be perfect or it will not behave correctly. And he gives us some insight as to how we accomplish that. We do it by subtraction. And I think it also applies to programming languages, that programming languages tend to get more complex over time, but if we want them to be perfect, we need to be removing stuff from them. <coughs> And that's the principle of the good parts. The good part says, if a feature is sometimes useful and sometimes dangerous, and if there is a better option, always use the better option. This is a surprisingly controversial statement. There are a lot of people who say, I don't want to use the better option. You can't make me use the better option. And it comes from a misunderstanding. We are not paid to use every feature of the language. At the end of a project, there isn't a manager with a clipboard saying, did you use double equal? <laughs> Nobody cares about that. What's important is we're paid to write programs that work well and are free of error. Free of error. When did free of error become part of the deal? It's always been part of the deal. It's just we attain it so rarely, it's easy to forget it was the first requirement. So a good programming language should teach you. I encourage people to learn as many languages as you can because they will all give you new insights which you can then apply to other languages. And the language which has taught me the most has been JavaScript, which um, took a long time for me to get it because I made every mistake with JavaScript that you can make. Starting with the first one, the worst one, I didn't bother to learn the language before I started writing in it because I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> um, eventually, I, I did learn the language, and it has been teaching me and is continuing to teach me. I, I use the language to write a tool called JSLint, which reads JavaScript programs and tells you how to make them better. And JSLint taught me even more. It changed my perspective on programming so that my first goal as I'm writing is to try to create programs that are going to be free of error. And J.S. Lint gave me enormous insight as to how to accomplish that. I wrote a book about my experiences with JavaScript and J.S. Lint called JavaScript the Good Parts. You may have heard of this. It's, a, it's about that thick. Um, it's still a bestseller, which is really rare for a software book. Most software books are obsolete before they're printed. And this one is still relevant, and it, it's because the good parts are still the good parts. What, what's good about the language has not changed at all. Now, there are arguments against using the good parts. Um, I'd like to, to run down them for you. The first is that what's good or what's bad is just a matter of opinion. And it turns out that is not true. That I'm the, the maintainer of JS Lint, and so I get bug reports from people from all over the world I recently got one from a company that spent two weeks chasing down some problem. It turned out someone had mistyped a period as an equal sign and that nobody saw it because it looked correct and the JavaScript engines thought it looked correct, but it behaved really, really badly. Uh, so they asked me if I could modify JS Lint so that no one else will ever have to suffer from that problem. And I've been doing this for years. And so if you use JS Lint, you will never experience those sorts of wasted two weeks trying to find this thing sorts of problems. That is not an opinion, that is a fact. Every feature is an essential tool. That's simply not true. You can write better programs by not using some of those features. And if you can write better programs without them, then they are not essential. I have a right to use every feature. 
the conversation has now changed. We're no longer talking about what's the best way to write programs. We're now talking about our rights. And this argument ultimately ends, bottoms out in, I have a right to write crap. And is that true? I don't know. I don't care. It's not important. What's more important is we have a responsibility to write programs that are good. I need the freedom to express myself. And I, I'm an artist, and I, I express myself by putting the semicolons at the front of the statement instead of at the end. <laughs> I need to reduce my keystrokes. This is a really tough one for us, because we imagine that we spend most of our time typing. And if we could figure out a way to compose programs with fewer keystrokes, we'd be much more effective. And it turns out it's not the typing. It's the gazing into the abyss saying, my god, what have I done? Why, <laughs> why isn't this working? That's where we spend most of our time. So if I could offer you a formula which said, we will increase your keystrokes by a factor of 10, but cut your errors in half, unfortunately, I don't have such a formula to offer you. But if I did, that would be a huge win. It is an insult to suggest I would ever make a mistake with a dangerous feature. Now, I know it can be misused, but I'm so skilled that I would never misuse it. You know, so, you know, and, you know, it's an insult to me. It's a personal injury to me. Mm. <laughs> and finally, there is a good reason those features were added to the language. That is absolutely not true. There are lots of reasons for why things get put into a language, and most of them are not good reasons. For example, JavaScript was designed and implemented in 10 days, which is amazing. And the, the man who did it, Brendan Eich, brilliant man, made some mistakes in those 10 days. One of them was the double equal operator, which he caused to do type coercion before it did the comparison that would cause it to have false, uh, false positives, which is confusing, causes errors. It breaks transitivity, which, which causes confusion and, and he recognized that he had gotten it wrong. Now, lots of other languages at the time made the same mistake. For example, PHP contains the same mistake. But he recognized it, and he wanted to correct it. So when the standard work began, he said, oh, this is the time to fix it. So he went to ECMA and said, this behavior is wrong. Let's do it correctly. And ECMA said, no, we're going to keep it wrong. But they offered as a compromise, we'll give you triple equal, and triple equal will work correctly, but we're going to leave double equal in the language for the people who already got it wrong. So it's in the language, not for a good reason. Brendan talks about features that he calls foot guns. A foot gun is a feature of a language that you use to shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> and he unintentionally put a lot of these into JavaScript. I almost always miss. Boom doesn't recommend you use them. So the purpose of a programming language is to aid programmers in producing error-free programs. We used to think that it was not possible to write good programs in JavaScript because it was such a flimsy language. But it turns out that not only is it possible to write good programs in JavaScript, it is necessary. JavaScript, because of all the flimsiness, requires more discipline than any other programming language. You really have to bring it to this language in order to write stuff that's going to work. Uh, two things that work against this that I've seen are the fantasy of infallibility. You see that especially in younger programmers who think their skills are so awesome that they can do this stuff and it just, you know, it's going to work or it doesn't matter, don't care. Um, then there's the futility of faultlessness. You see this especially with old guys. You know, I've been doing this for years. It never works. It's never going to work. You know, why, why bother? You know. <laughs> Two very different perspectives, but they both lead to the same thing, danger-driven development. <laughs> oh, and, and don't forget your semicolon. So um, one of the things that makes managing of software so difficult is the difficulty of scheduling. And there are two times you have to be aware of. Time A is the time that it takes to write the code. And we are really bad at estimating what that should be. We have no science which tells us how to estimate time A. But even worse is time B, the time that it takes to make the code work right. Now, time B should be 0, right? You write the code, and it should work. But time B is sometimes larger than time A. Time B is sometimes infinite. That's what happens when you've got a project where the software gets finished, but they, 
it gets canceled before they ever get it to work. So anything that you do in time A, which increases time B, that's wrong. You, you want to try to drive time B to be zero. We should always take the time to code well. Sometimes if we have to do something quick and dirty, we'll just say, slap it together really fast, except you still have to make it work. You know, even if you're in a hurry, you still have to make it work. So you still have to code it well, even in those cases. So there's a new edition of ECMAScript that uh, will go to the ECMA General Assembly in June of this year. Hopefully it will be uh, approved by the General Assembly, and at some time later it'll roll out in all the JavaScript engines. And I'm happy to report there are going to be some good parts, some very good parts in the new language. I'd like to share those with you this morning. The first and best is something called proper tail calls. If the last thing a function does is return the result of calling a function, could be itself or calling a different function, the compiler, instead of generating a call return sequence, will generate a jump. So that code will run a little bit faster, which is nice. But even better, for some patterns, it will significantly reduce memory consumption so that a whole new class of algorithms can be employed. For example, we can do continuation passing style and other sorts of programming which we cannot do in the language today. So with this feature, JavaScript finally becomes a real functional programming language, and that's going to be great. I'm, I'm, I can't wait for this one. Next, we're getting the ellipsis operator, dot, dot, dot. If we put this in a parameter list or in an argument list, it allows us to deal with a variable number of arguments, which is really nice. So here we've got two versions of the curry function. The first one is the way we write it in ES6. The second one is the way we write it today. I'm not going to explain what that's doing because it's inexcusable. This is just horrible, horrible, horrible stuff. This is pretty reasonable. It says anywhere where you see the dots, you can have as much stuff as you want. And that's brilliant. I just love that. It doesn't let us do anything that we can't do today. But if you need to deal with a variable number of arguments, it's a much, much nicer thing than the arguments array. We've got modules in the language. So now you can import values and export values from different files and cause them all to come together. Uh, it's finally supported in the language now. It used to be that the way this stuff was done was with global variables, which is terrible. Um, we can now do it right. It's now baked into the language, so you don't have to use that crappy uh, require stuff that, that you have to use in Node right now. Eventually, we'll be able to do it right. In the, lang in the language, it's going to be fully asynchronous. We won't have any of the blocking that require does. This will be really good. We've got uh, two new ways of defining constants, or co defining variables, let and const. Um, these solve the problem of block scope. It turns out you don't need block scope in order to write good programs, but JavaScript has syntax that looks like it's block scoped, but it's not with its var statement, and that confuses people. Whenever you have confusion, bugs happen. So again, this doesn't let us write any programs that we can't write now, but it'll conf not confuse the Java guys so much, and that's good. <laughs> We've got destructuring, which is another bit of syntactic sugar. It doesn't let you do anything that you couldn't do before. But for certain kinds of things, it's much more expressive. For example, here I've got an object, and I want to create some variables and initialize those variables with properties from the object. And it's a very streamlined notation for doing that. I'll, later, I'll show you an example of how you could use this. Uh, we have weak maps. Weak maps work the way objects should have worked in the language. In JavaScript, object keys have to be strings, which was a mistake. It would have been better if they could have been any value, but they have to be strings. So weak maps do that. So you can take any value and use it as a key and retrieve values. Unfortunately, we had to add it as another thing, so it made the language much more complicated. And we also gave it the worst name ever put on a feature in a programming language. Because nobody wants to put something weak in their program, right? Yeah, why, why would you do that? But it's really good. And you can write programs using a weak map that are impossible to write in the language today. So that, that's going to be a good thing. Then finally, we've got what I call megastring literals. 
in, in the language they're called, um, what are they called, template strings, which I, I don't get that name. And before that, they were called quasi-literals, which confused everybody. So this is um, a regular expression which matches number literals in ES6. And the regular expression notation is just horrible. I'm hoping someday we get away from that and do something better. But in ES6, because we've got the new megastrings, <laughs> we've got a better alternative. So this is a function which will take a string and transform it into a regular expression, removing all the white space first. So having such a function, I can take that same regular expression, but now write it as a, a megastring, putting all the white space in there so I can see what are the elements of this regular expression, how do they relate to each other. So that one and, and the top one will do exactly the same thing. Which one would you rather have to maintain? Now, there is a disadvantage to this one. Because the compiler sees it as a string and not as a regular expression, it can't do any validation on it. The validation won't happen until we call the constructor. But because this notation is so, so terse, it's very easy for serious errors to slip by the compiler anyway. So I don't think we lose a lot in this transformation. Now, if you are doing stuff with regular expressions, I highly recommend a tool called Regulex. You put a regular expression in it, and it draws railroad diagrams of it, so you can see exactly what it does, and it puts boxes around the caption groups. It's, I use this every day when I'm writing regular expressions. Um, OK, so an, another new feature we get in the language is uh, farts, or fat arrow functions. The motivation for this was there are some people who complained that function was too many letters to type. They said, well, we've got this new thing called keyboard macros. They said, well, it's too much to read. So, um, so we added this thing. So it's a shorter notation for writing functions. So in this case, I've got a function which will take a name argument and return an object where the, value, the ID property has that name value. Except this doesn't work. If you call this function, it'll return undefined instead because there's a design error in the way this works. So it's, this is another one of those marginal things. It's sometimes good and sometimes bad. So it would have been nice if it worked all the time, but it doesn't. So uh, there are going to be some clearly bad parts in, in ES6. The worst of those is going to be class. <laughs> class was the most requested new feature. And the re most of the requests came from Java programmers who are now having to write in JavaScript, and they are really resentful about it. They'd much rather be writing in Java, but the jobs are in JavaScript now, so they're having to do that, and they don't want to have to learn it. And so having this new syntax will make it easier for them. Except that, relying on this new syntax, they will never understand how the language works, and they will never understand how to use the language effectively. They will think that they understand it, and they won't. They will go to their graves, never knowing how miserable they are. <laughs> this is a trap. It's a trap. So um, I've been reconsidering what I wrote in the good parts, given what I've learned since then, and also uh, reflecting on what happened in ES6. So when I wrote the good parts, I recommended not using new using object.create instead. In fact, I managed to get object.create added to the language so that I could use it. So <laughs> that worked out pretty well. So I was really surprised when I noticed that I had stopped using object.create. I mean, I put it in there just for me, and even I don't use it. And the reason for that is that I stopped using this. And the reason I stopped using this is because I did a project in 2007 called AdSafe. At that time, there were a number of research teams and companies, like there was FBJS at Facebook, there was Kaha at Google, there was Web Sandbox at Microsoft, there was my own AdSafe project, we were, and others, and we were all trying to figure out how to make JavaScript a safe language so that we could put th third-party code into an application and be confident that third-party code cannot escape its security confines. And that turns out 
to be really hard in JavaScript. And one of the things that makes it hard is this. Because if you have this in a method, this gets bound to the object of interest, which is good and necessary. But if you call that same method as a function, this gets bound to the global object, and that completely violates our security. How do you deal with that? What most of the other projects did was they wrote a compiler that would translate JavaScript into JavaScript, and the translation would include lots of runtime checking and indirection in order to prevent that from happening. My approach with AdSafe was much simpler. I said, let's make this illegal. So if anyone's using this, we'll reject their program, and we're done. That turned out to, to work. Um, the only problem with it is it rejected virtually 100% of all programs because everybody has been writing with this. But my hypothesis was that if you remove this from the language, you're still left with a functional programming language, and that is adequate for writing good programs. So to test that, I started writing in that dialect, in this free JavaScript. And I was really surprised to discover that not only was it not a burden, it actually made things easier, that I was writing better programs with less effort by not having this. I thought, wow, that's pretty nice. In fact, just having this in the language makes it really difficult to talk about it. You know, when, when you say this, you know, this is also a pronoun, you know, which this you're talking about. It's like pair programming with Abbott and Costello. It's, it's just complicated. I've stopped using null. JavaScript has two bottom values, null and undefined. Some languages say you shouldn't have any. JavaScript's the only language that says you should have more than one. So I decided, well, it's silly to have both of them. You know, some frameworks try to treat them as being interchangeable, and they're not. They, they, they are not the same thing. Um, so I decided I should only use one. And so I'm using undefined because that is the one that the language itself uses. You know, if you ask for a missing property, you get undefined. With, so that's the one that I look for. Also, this gets a, around the type of problem, type of null returns object, which is completely wrong. And we were hoping that would get fixed in ES6, but it didn't. That'll be probably wrong forever. But if you don't use null, then you won't experience that problem. And I stopped using falsiness. I've decided that the falsy values in JavaScript were a bad idea. It was an idea that was borrowed from C. C uses zero to represent null and, and false and other values. And JavaScript tried to do the same trick. but it's confusing, and it, it divides the set of domains into to weird cases. So I now explicitly look for values. Um, I've stopped using four. In ES5, we introduced a new set of array methods for each, and map and, and others. So I use those exclusively now. If, I'm, if I have an array and I need to process it, I use the method. And I can, String those together in nice ways. It's really expressive. I don't use for. I, I don't use for each because in ES5 we got object.keys. So object.keys will give you a nice array of strings, and it doesn't include stuff from the prototype chain, so you don't have to filter those results. So that's really nice. And then I can take that array and do for each on that. So that, that's a really expressive way to write stuff. ES6, as I said before, is going to have proper tail calls. And at that point, I will stop using loops entirely. I will only be using recursive functions. So for example, this is the repeat function. You pass it a function, and it calls that function until it returns undefined. The first version of it is written using a while loop. The second version is written using tail recursion. In ES6, these two should run at exactly the same speed, consuming exactly the same amount of memory. So there will no longer be a performance benefit to using loops over recursion. That'll be great. So I've been thinking a lot about the next language. What, what is the next language going to be? There's got to be a language which replaces JavaScript, because it would be really sad if it turns out JavaScript is the last programming language. No, that's just intolerable. You know, we've got to do better, at least for our kids, right? We, <laughs> it can't end here. So I've been thinking about what is that language going to be like? What sort of properties will it have? How will we recognize when it's here? 
It's sort of like waiting for the Messiah. What are the signs? How will we know? And it's complicated. I suspect it'll probably be an actor language, but I'm not sure. And you know, what does that even mean? What properties will it have? What problems will it, will it allow us to solve that we cannot easily solve now? You know, just looking for that language. One thing I'm confident of, that when it finally does arrive, we will reject it out of hand. We'll just, no, no. And the reason for that is that programmers are as emotional and irrational as normal people. <laughs> we think that we, we're not. We think that we're ultra-rational because we are the ambassadors to the computer and computers are completely rational. And, and we think we're that way too. We have no social skills, obviously, but um, <laughs> turns out we're still wildly irrational and emotional. So uh, let me present some evidence to support that. It took a generation to agree that high-level languages were a good idea. You know, when Fortran came along, there were a lot of assembly language programmers. In fact, they were all assembly language programmers at that time. And they refused to get onto Fortran because Fortran took some control away from them. They, they had this stuff in between them and the machine. They, they just couldn't do it. It would have made their lives so much better, but they refused to do it. It took a generation to agree that GoTo was a bad idea. Dijkstra published his letter in the CACM in 1968, and we had violent emotional arguments for decades about whether we should be using GoTo or not. And the arguments were all deeply felt from very smart people. It's the way I express myself. I need the efficiency. You, you know, you, my cold, dead hands, you can't take it away from me. Um, Turned out all those arguments were completely wrong. All, all, you know, getting rid of GoTo makes programming easier. Uh, it took a generation to agree that objects were a good idea. Objects were discovered in a language called Simula in Norway in 1967. Only one person in the world, as far as I can tell, Alan Kay, who at that time I think was at the University of Utah, recognized what an important idea that was. Everybody else missed it. He thought the objects that were in Simula were going to be so powerfully expressive that he could design a programming language for children. And children could write amazing programs using this paradigm. So he began research on a language which ended up being Smalltalk. And he spent almost a decade designing and refining and improving that language until it was finally published in 1980, and it is the best designed programming language in the history of programming languages. Now we, C++ took some of those ideas, didn't quite get them right, but put them on C. You know, so the industry had a choice. Are we going to go with Smalltalk? Are we going to go C with C++? The decision was made by people who fundamentally did not understand what object-oriented programming was. And they made the choice to go with C++ because you didn't need to understand object-oriented programming at all in order to get started with that language. And almost all of our languages since then borrowed more from the C++ heritage than from the Smalltalk heritage, and so we're still getting it wrong. Then finally, it took two generations to agree that lambdas were a good idea. Lambdas were discovered in a language called Scheme at MIT in the early 70s. And when it was discovered, again, the industry took no notice of it at all. And this one took not two generations. It took four, or it took two generations to, to finally get to the mainstream. It took so long that some people said that <coughs> that was proof that it was a bad idea. But it's now starting to, to happen because it turns out Functional programming, which is the thing that you get from lambdas, is so effective in dealing with asynchronicity and distributed systems, which is stuff that we're dealing with today. Anyone know what the first language was to take this idea and bring it to the mainstream of programming languages? Anybody? JavaScript. It was JavaScript, yeah. Followed quickly by Python and Ruby and, and eventually C Sharp. And, and last year, finally, Java can now do this. But JavaScript was the first. The reason these things take so long is that we do not change minds. We have to wait for a generation to retire or die before we can get critical mass on the good idea and keep going. <coughs> I, I, I remember when 
um, go to happened. You know, this argument was going on for years, and then suddenly it was quiet. It's like, are they gone? <laughs> Can we get rid of the go-to now? So we just, we just dropped it. And who is suffering from not having a go-to? I mean, it turned out the whole argument was pointless. It's just, it was a paradigm shift. And it is really difficult for people to do the paradigm shift. And this one was just, get rid of one statement and change the way you think about how you structure the programs. And, and by doing that, you can double the complexity of the program and still manage it. It, it turns out it makes programming easier. The people who would have most benefited from that step forward would not have it. So, that, and so that's why I, I think the next language will get rejected. So think about how we categorize these languages. Um, I, I divide languages into two sets, systems languages and application languages. A systems language is something you'd use to write a memory allocator or manager, a, a kernel, uh, device drivers, really low-level stuff. Everything else should be written in application languages. In my view, the biggest design error in Java was it couldn't decide which side of this line it wanted to be on. And so it's trying to straddle and so you end up, end up with terrible things like threads in applications. And, I, and we need new languages in both categories. For example, the dominant system language today is still C which you know, came from the 60s. We've lost the ability to innovate in programming languages. Why, why don't we have a, a better one? We, it's embarrassing. Uh, but I'm more concerned with the application languages because that's where most of us are going to be living. So you can take the application languages and divide those into two sets. There's the classical school, which is almost every language today, and there's a prototypal school, which is almost exclusively JavaScript. And I think JavaScript got this one right, although that most of the criticism that JavaScript gets is that it, it contains that innovation. So if you're in the classical school, it means that when you're designing a system, you have to do a classification. You have to look at all of the objects in your system and understand what they're composed of. And then you have to do a taxonomy. You have to figure out how those classes are going to be related to each other, what's going to inherit from what, what's going to implement what. And that turns out to be really hard because you're doing it at the point of the project, usually at the beginning, where you have the least understanding of how the system is going to work. And so invariably, inevitably, you get the taxonomy wrong. And so you end up with object graphs that don't quite fit. And, you're, and from that point on, you're struggling with it, that things don't compose right. You're wishing that you had multiple inheritance, that things just, it's not working. And you find that that breakage works its way into the newer upper levels so that everything else that inherits from the first set of objects is also wrong. And you get these structural problems all through the system and eventually it gets so bad that you have to refactor, which is something you don't want to have to do because you have to break everything apart and put it back together in a better way and you hope that it comes back together and it might not. And it turns out that's just, that is not an inevitable part of object-oriented programming, it's just classes. And if you're doing object-oriented programming without classes, you don't have to do any of that. So in JavaScript, if you're just doing the prototypes and you're doing it properly, you don't have to do the taxonomy. You don't do the, the refactoring. It's just so much easier. And I try to explain that to Java guys, and they go, wow. Except you still have to do the taxonomy, right? And, and sometimes you have to refactor and go, no, you don't have to do that. And they go, wow, that's amazing. I completely get it. Except you still have to do the taxonomy, right? It, it, it's another of these paradigm shift things, right? They just can't imagine, you know, you know this, the taxonomy is making them miserable, but they can't imagine any other way to do it. So um, I used to be a strong advocate of prototypal inheritance. The, the major benefit it gives us is memory conservation. If we're using object.create instead of object.copy, basically the only real difference is how much memory are we allocating to each object. And that may have been an important consideration in 1995, but it isn't today. Moore's Law has continued to ramp up memory capacity. You now literally have gigabytes of RAM in your pocket. You can't imagine how much memory that is. And so worrying about how many bits we're allocating per object today is a complete waste of time, but we're, we're still doing that. So um, 
so the, the benefit that we get from prototypes, it turns out, is not really a benefit. And there are some costs. We have owned properties versus inherited properties. They're different, and that difference causes confusion, and that's a source of errors. Uh, we get retroactive heredity, that you can change what an object inherits after it is constructed. There's no good use for that, uh, but I can imagine lots of very bad uses for that. It also is performance inhibiting. Modern JavaScript engines go very fast today by making assumptions about the shape of objects, but they have to be pessimistic about prototype chains because a, po a prototype can potentially change at any time. So having that level of indirection in the language is actually slowing things down. So I, I used to, to be in favor of prototypal inheritance. I am now an advocate of class-free object-oriented programming. I think class-free object-oriented programming is JavaScript's gift to humanity. So let me explain what I mean by that. So this is an example of block scope. You know, we've got let now in the language, so you can now create an inner block, which can see the variables of the outer block, but the outer block can't see the variables of the inner block. JavaScript has always been able to do this with functions, because a function is just a block that's associated with an object that allows you to, to execute that block later. And so the, the functions have the same relationship, and we can graph that relationship, or we show it as sets. So that's the set of variables that the outer function can see, and that's the set of variables that the inner function can see. And we can see that that set encloses the other set. And so that's why we call this relationship closure, which is, it comes from set theory. It's just one set encloses another set. This idea took a long time to get to the mainstream because of this problem. What if the inner function lives longer than the outer function? In this case, the outer function, when it's called, allocates an A on the stack, but when it returns, the A is removed from the stack, but now the inner function wants to use that A. How, how do you do that? It, and it took a couple generations to figure out how to do it. It turns out it's trivial. Just don't use a stack. And just allocate all the activations on a heap, have a good garbage collector, it's easy. So that, that's what we're doing now. So having all of this, this is how I'm going to be making objects when ES6 comes out. So I've got my constructor function. I'm writing it without an initial cap because it doesn't require the use of new. I'm passing in a specification object. I, I like that much better than passing in some number of variables. Some years ago, I designed a terrible constructor that had 10 parameters and nobody could remember what order they went in. And after a while, we realized that nobody ever used the third parameter, but we couldn't change it, and it was just awful. If instead, I'd passed in a single object which described the thing that we're trying to make, it would have been much more flexible. We could have default values. We could have um, add things, remove things over time as the thing evolved. So I'm going to make a constant, a bunch of constant things. I'm going to be using the new destructuring to um, take values out of the specification object and initialize uh, private variables. I can call another constructor. I can pass the same specification object to it. It will return an object. I will then take methods out of that function and put those into local variables. And I can call as many of these as I want. So if I want multiple inheritance or some kind of aspect-y kind of thing, I can very easily do that. I will then create my methods. My methods will close over all the members, over all of the other methods, over all the methods I create and the specification object, and I do not use this at any time. And then I return uh, the, the public functions in an object, and we've got an, another shorthand notation here in ES6. So instead of saying method colon method, I can simply say method, which is nice, so it looks more like a declaration than a literal. And then I'm going to freeze it so that it's now an object which cannot be tampered with, cannot be corrupted, which can properly defend all of its private state. It's the best way in the language in order to accomplish that, and I think that's a really important property for objects to have. So in the beginning of object-oriented programming, we start with sort of the Pascal idea that we've got a record, 
And then we associate functions with that record that are the methods that act upon the, the members. And we kind of got stuck there. Um, I'm, I've now moved beyond that. I now have two completely different sets of objects. I've got these frozen objects which just contain functions, and then I've got malleable objects which just contain data. And I don't mix them up. I use one to stand in front of the other to protect and, and provide discipline to it. So that's how I'm going to be making stuff. So how much? OK, I've got time to tell you a bug story. So in 2001, I made a bug, and I have to confess it to you now. <coughs> So I was writing in Java, it was uh, the, one of the first JSON parsers, and it contained this statement. Uh, I created a private variable called index, and it was an int. It measured how many characters you were within a file or a, st a stream that it was parsing, so that if it found a syntax error, it could tell you at what character position the error occurred. And when I wrote this in 2001, I thought, well, that'll get me up to two billion, that's two gigabytes. That was a pretty big disk drive at that time. I couldn't imagine JSON text would get any bigger. The biggest one I had ever made was a couple of K. So I thought this was pretty good. Till last year, I got a bug report from someone who had a JSON text that was several gigabytes in size, and it contained a syntax error past two billion. And so it reported a message which was wildly wrong, which was embarrassing, and it was because I said int. That turned out to have been a mistake. I hate ints. Ints have these terrible properties. You know, they, they, they overflow without detection. So what should happen if you have a number that's too big to put into a cell? What should happen? There's one school that says, well, the machine should halt, which is maybe a little drastic. It's not good for the five nines. But at least you're not going to generate incorrect results. Better would be to raise an exception, you know, so you can say, yeah, Something went wrong. Another might be substitute a NAND value so that you know whatever when you go and look in that cell, it'll tell you whatever you're looking for, it ain't here. If you were trying to maximize errors, what would be the worst thing you could do? It'd be hard to improve on what we do now, which is to throw away the most significant bits and don't tell anybody. That is a source of errors, and it's a terrible one. It's one that never gets caught in testing because the tests all have assumptions that everything's going to fit in the ranges, right? And it might be that something is going to run for 10 or 20 years before it finally fails. I don't want stuff to ever fail. And so there's an invitation to fail in ints. Um, and the reason this came about was in the 50s, computers were made out of vacuum tubes. And the more tubes you have, the more power it takes, the, the more it costs, the quicker the tubes burn out. It's just awful. And someone figured out that if we use complement arithmetic instead of sine magnitude, we do not have to put a subtract circuit into the ALU. It was like, that really was brilliant. I, I think every 50 years ago, we should ask, our, why are we still doing this? You know, I, I, I think we're way past the value that we got from that. Also, memory used to be really scarce. You know, a machine might only have a couple K in it. The Atari 2600 only had 128 bytes in it. And so you didn't want to allocate 64 bits to something which could be represented as four bits. And that persists in our languages. For example, in Java, you've got byte, char, short, int, long, float, and double. So every time you have to create a parameter or a variable or a member, you have to ask, hmm. Which one of those? <laughs> the value of the, of the memory that you're saving is so small as to be meaningless. There's no benefit for having made the right choice. In fact, the time that you spent going, hmm, is worth infinitely more than the value that you saved. And if you get it wrong, it's going to fail in a way that the tests will not discover. It's, it's bad stuff. JavaScript, on the other hand, only has one number type. So you cannot make a wrong number type error, which is great. The only problem with JavaScript is it's the wrong type. <laughs> and the reason it's the wrong type is because of this. That point 0.1 plus point 0.2 is not equal to point 0.3. This is kind of a fundamental thing, right? And it happens a lot with money, right? Because 
these are cents, right? And they don't add up. And when you're adding people's money, they have a reasonable expectation you're gonna get the right sum, and you can't with binary floating point, which is what we're using. Binary floating point is something which, again, made sense in the 50s. In the 40s, when the first von Neumann machines started coming online, um, they only had signed uh, magnitude and integers, and they did a lot of stuff with scaled arithmetic in order to, to get real values, and it was hard. And someone figured out, if we have a second value associated with each number which tells us where the decimal point is, then we can put it into a subroutine and it's a lot easier, and it was. Unfortunately, it was really slow. So there was a lot of interest in moving that floating point stuff into hardware. And that happened in the 50s. And again, some brilliant engineer realized that if we go with binary floating point instead of decimal floating point, instead of doing a shift or a divide by 10, we can do a shift of one bit, which is a lot cheaper. So that's what they did. And we're still doing it, and we can't stop doing it. And it's wrong, and it causes us problems. It was so wrong in the 50s that the business guys said, we can't use that. That's no good. They went with BCD instead, binary coded decimal. And in fact, their programming languages were completely different. So you could be using Fortran with a floating point, or you could be using COBOL with the BCD. And when you ordered your mainframe, you would also order which arithmetic unit you got, the floating point or the BCD unit. Then things got more confused. Eventually, Java became the inheritor of COBOL. But Java was not designed to do business processing, and so the numbers just don't work. So I propose a solution to this terrible problem, something I call DEC64. It's a 64-bit value, which actually looks very similar to what they did back in the 40s. I've got a 56-bit coefficient, which is just a big integer, and an 8-bit exponent. By putting the exponent in the most, most or least significant part, on Intel architecture, I can unpack that for free. Because, you know, it's just really easy. And the reason it works is because of that 10 there. There's a 10 instead of the 2. And so this works. This does everything you want for scientific, and it does everything you want for business. It's just great. So I propose this as the only number type in future application languages. System languages have other needs, and so they'll do other things. But for application languages, which is where most of us are going to live, I propose this to be the only number type. Um, I've written a, an implementation of it in uh, Intel x64 assembly language, so if you want to try it out. In a hardware implementation, most numbers will add in one cycle, which eliminates the need for having a separate int type. And for everything else, it'll just work, and it'll count the money correctly. So again, I propose this to be the only number type going on, which means I have to convince everybody in the world this is the way we're going to do it. And you know, that's, I recognize how hard that is. Except it turns out I don't have to convince everybody in the world. I only have to convince one person, and that's the man or the woman who designs the next programming language. If I can convince that person this is the one number type you want, a number type that works well for humans, that does arithmetic the way we were taught to do it in, in, in middle school, then it wins. Now, I have a little bit of experience with convincing the whole world to do the right thing. For example, uh, there's a JSON, the world's best loved data interchange format. Uh, <laughs> So I only have a minute left, so I just want to give you a status report. So this is Google Trends showing the relative popularity between XML and JSON. You can see from this that the world has steadily been losing interest in XML since 2005, and it's been very slowly growing up for JSON. The growth in JSON has not been due to any industry influence. You know, there is no JSON industry which is driving this. There aren't any big corporations that are selling big JSON tool chains because you don't need big JSON tools to do JSON. It's just, well, that's why you like it, right? Because it just, it just works. And it looks like there's a crossover coming, and I can't predict when that's going to happen, but Google can. So um, if, you, <laughs> if you push the predict button on, on, on Google Trends, it says this year 
JSON will finally be officially more interesting than XML. So thank you and good night.